Hello guys, thanks for joining us. We are here with another interview from the Titans of Gaming family, uh, and it's Richard Garfield this time. Always great to talk to Richard. It's great to have you here, Richard. Thanks so much for being on. Um, and we're gonna talk about the first title that's coming out of this Titans of Gaming uh, Kickstarter, and that is Hive Mind. Can you give us a little rundown on what this game's all about? Hive Mind is uh, a party game that uh, I designed uh, many years ago. And the idea, the, the fiction behind it is that the hive doesn't have enough food for the winter. And so the queen has to let some drones go. And, nice. and so she's going to administer a test. And uh, that test, it does not matter how accurate you are. It matters whether you think like everyone else. And uh, so if you uh, fail the test, you're going to go out and hopefully found a new hive. So it's a, in a lot of ways, it was designed to be sort of an anti-trivia game uh, because the idea was that uh, you would ask questions and, and it didn't matter what the correct answer was. It mattered that you answered like everyone else. So for example, if you asked the question, uh, what's the longest river in the world? Many groups that I've played with, uh, the, the answer for the hive is the Amazon. Nice. But that's not... The correct answer, and so people who answered Nile, the correct answer, well, they've got one strike, and uh, fortunately for them, there's usually somebody who says Mississippi or something. So, uh, so uh, it's only the low, the low, the low score which uh, which uh, gets the strike. Um, but it goes beyond uh, trivia questions. Uh, it it also uh, goes to just like name three planets, and if you name three planets, uh, why don't you go ahead name three planets, and I'll tell you how you do. Uh, Saturn, Jupiter, and Mars. Uh, okay, so in my Love groups, it. now this of course depends on your group. Your group, you may be the center of the hive. In my groups, Saturn is pretty weak. Uh, Jupiter's good, and Mars is really good. But uh, your whole uh, position is kind of iffy because in my groups, Earth almost always gets mentioned. That's right. Um, but it is again, <laughs> you're probably okay because there's probably somebody in your group who's going to go Pluto, Saturn, Uranus, uh, and uh, and then they're, and then they they get the strike. And apparently, I mean, apparently Pluto's not even a planet anymore. It's a dwarf right? planet. That's right. Uh, sense, and, yeah. and, <laughs> and you know, that's one of the real pleasures of the game is that is that uh, if you answer Pluto, there's no uh, question as to whether it's a planet or not. You answered Pluto. That's what, uh, and, and the hive might go there. So, for example. Um, <laughs> My uh, uh, partner in, uh, three, in the company, Three Donkeys, which is what we do our design work through, he ran a game with his family, and uh, one of the questions was, name five rap stars. And the, he was playing with uh, a large table that included some older generation and some younger generation. And the younger generation just was like, yeah, and they, they, <laughs> they all named five. Uh, a bunch of rap stars and the older generation just rolled their eyes and they had no idea what to put down and so it turned out the most popular answer was Frank Sinatra oh, and, man. and meanwhile the people who knew real rap stars uh, were all over the map and so they got very little lot to line up wow there, so. <laughs> that's excellent yeah how cool so is this the kind of thing where you are passing the title of queen around every round or is there one queen who enters the game and it's the same queen that, that leaves the game uh, what what happens? So, if you want to try this game at home, which uh, uh, I encourage you to do, uh, then then what you do is just take take turns asking questions. Um, and uh, if uh, in the boxed version, uh, uh, that's pretty much the way it'll work. But there'll be uh, also some some cards you draw, which will have questions on it, which you can choose. Between. Between, so people will take turns, but the queen is not adjudicating anything. The uh, that is the person okay. who's playing the queen, because uh, so one of the things I really want to avoid in this is is there's uh, a lot of uh, scruples type games where in these scruple types game, oftentimes people are asked to predict, for example, what a particular player will say, but they're not necessarily motivated to answer honestly. They're uh, motivated to answer in such a way that the leader doesn't get any more points. And uh, I, I don't like it when your motivation, what you're supposed to do in the game doesn't line up to what's rewarded. And so in Hive Mind, that's not an issue. The queen reads a question, everybody answers it, and there's no question of honesty or dishonesty uh, or accuracy 
accuracy or inaccuracy. It's just whether you match everybody else. Perfect. Cool. I like you know, I, in these kinds of games, so you said like a player gets a strike, and uh, if they answer like the least in the in the hive mind. So is this the kind of game where eventually everybody is kind of getting knocked out until there's one person remaining? Uh, or is, it, is everyone always playing this game until the very end? Uh, that's a, that's a, a good question. And uh, the answer is you're always playing it to the end because uh, we don't play for a winner. We play it for a loser or a couple losers. When somebody, when somebody has been ejected, it's time to start a new game. And uh, at that point, uh, everybody uh, breathes a collective sigh of relief that they are not uh, evicted from the hive. Um, so uh, playing for a loser is a, uh, um, it's sort of, it's, it's not done very much these days, but historically, uh, playing for forfeits is something which is, uh, is, is, has seen a lot of uh, action in the past. And there's a lot of reasons that that's kind of interesting. It's uh, because everybody is in the game until the end. Uh, you don't, like if you've got two strikes and your third strike, you're going to be out. All you have to do is be in the hive longer than somebody else, and and if they get that strike, they're out. And there's no winner or loser. If you've got two strikes and I've got zero strikes, it doesn't matter. We're both in the hive, um, and uh, and so and so that's that's the way this game is constructed. Nice, excellent. Well, that sounds that sounds absolutely fascinating. Now I know that uh, with similar games, you have an inspiration that is based on like a theme. I know that the pecking order game, for instance, where you actually were watching birds and you said, hey, th this would be an interesting idea for a game. And on the other end, a lot of times you come in with a mechanic and then kind of tie theme to that and, and redesign in the process. Uh, so what was the initial spark or inspiration for uh, this game that you're doing for Titans? Well, I, I think, as I mentioned, uh, anti-trivia, it was probably, uh, I, I was thinking about that. I was thinking about, uh, this is a long time ago, so. I'm doing probably some creative reconstruction, but uh, uh, but what what I think happened was uh, I had had a game where uh, an evening where we played something like Trivial Pursuit, and um, I began to think of how uh, hostile often the trivia games were. How not host hostile is the wrong word, but how yeah. uh, skill testing they were mm -hmm. in that the same trivia nerds would always win, and a lot of the people who were not that into trivia sort of found themselves drifting, you know, not, not so interested in playing that. And so uh, I was trying to get a game which would engender uh, discussion and involve the same sort of open-ended exploration of, of, uh, of, of knowledge, but at the same time uh, be less threatening. Yeah, well, it sounds like that's exactly uh, what you can do. I, I've, <laughs> I've seen in some of the past interviews that you you talk a lot about a trivia game idea that you had that, at least uh, back when I was reading those articles, it was unpublished at the time. Uh, so you've always been kind of interested in trivia as a concept for a game, right? Um, uh, I would say I've been interested in... Well, I've got a philosophy of game design, which is that uh, um, you play a, a really wide variety of games and if you don't like them or don't understand what's liked about them you play them until you do and mm. and so trivia is is a, is a game area so uh, I've explored it and thought about it and uh, um, and I've grown to really love it um, I think back when I did uh, back when I first began thinking about hive mind um, I was thinking more aggressively about trivia. Like I was thinking about the problems of trivia, which was, as I said, uh, the people who know the trivia end up winning and everybody else ends up feeling bad. Um, and since then, I actually read this book by Ken Jennings called Brainiac. Uh, Ken mm -hmm. Jennings, uh, you'll recall, is the uh, uh, Jeopardy champ uh, who won you know, uh, lots and lots on Jeopardy and be became a star. And he's actually a, a, a really good writer as well. Uh, I was impressed by Brainiac and read all his books since. Nice. And he, he really got me to, I mean, when I read it, I, I actually wasn't thinking, expecting much because the people I know who are really good at trivia are often kind of boring. <laughs> uh, but, and, and so I read this book, which was a gift. 
and I was really impressed. It was like he really gave me, explained to me what the love of trivia was. I really began to uh, appreciate it. And so, um, and so since then, uh, this may be the game you're referring to. There's an unpublished uh, trivia game I've got, which is more uh, orthodox trivia. That is, uh, um, I, I tried to uh, take the trivia genre and share with people it, and, and make it broader so that it wasn't always the trivia nerds who would win, but of course they'd have the advantage. Um, and uh, and actually, I'll, I'm going to be working with uh, with with Ken on that, uh, hopefully. Oh that's wow, cool. that's an exciting project yeah. for sure. Uh, well, so we've been talking about these kind of simpler games, the trivia style, the gateway games that you're doing for for Titans. And I mean, obviously, you've done a number of very complex titles over the years, whether it's you know Netrunner, Magic, Robo Rally, these kinds of games. Uh, does your design approach change when you're working on a lighter title? Is there do you actually come into it in a different way for a gateway game? A lot of my game design is trying to extend the game beyond its natural target, so to speak. Like if I've got a a, a sort of a hardcore game like a Magic, a lot of my design effort is into trying to make that uh, as appealing to the casual player as possible. And uh, and so similarly, when I've got a game like uh, um, Hive Mind uh, or this other trivia game, uh, which is is made to be very casual, I'm trying to think of uh, ways to make it interesting to the people who really want to play seriously. Make it so that they feel like they've got something they they can get their teeth into. Yeah. So I, I want it to be uh, something that they can think about, but not something that if they think about it, they get a huge payoff because that makes it. Uh, that makes it less um, egalitarian. Uh, there's a lot of people who won't feel like they're part of that game. Yeah. That sounds, yeah. Yeah. We. It, it seems like so you've designed a lot of games and they're all they all f always feel so unique and so different. Uh, whereas some designers all follow and they're doing kind of variations on a theme that they continue to explore. Uh, is is there anything about your approach specifically that you can point to that says this is kind of why I have these broad games? I'm sure it has a lot to do with what you said earlier about that philosophy of trying new games and trying different things. But are your all, eyes like always open to new ideas and new designers and new developments that uh, you try to integrate? Uh, yes, it is about my interest in really playing and learning what makes all the games tick. So there's a lot of designers who have a philosophy of trying to sort of sequester themselves uh, so that they're not influenced by other designs. And, and some of these designers are uh, excellent designers. Um, but this is sort of philosophically very, very far from me. I, I like to think of uh, games as being like like almost everything else in culture, writing and science and all, you, you, you build upon the work of other people and uh, you stand on the shoulder of giants as, as, as it were. Um, and, and so when I hear a game designer say proudly that they've never played a particular game uh, and in fact that they don't play many games, they try to design uh, outside the influence of other games, uh, I always think of, well, what would I think of a writer who said, I'd never read anybody else's books. Mm. I only read in a closet. You expect writers to be well-read, and, uh, and I expect game designers to be well-played. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It does. Um, how, did you enjoy stepping back and, and making just kind of a lighter you know, hive mind? Was it a, a more fun experience for you to not have to dive into these more kind of complex rules and interactions? Um, or do you actually do you get a kick out of out of those really deep uh, game designs? I do get a kick out of it, but it is a relief when you can step back. Um, uh, I, I, I do, in particular, when you start going to electronic design, and so you've got uh, the computer handling a lot of the details, which allows you to uh, really go overboard with some of the complexity because. Uh, the player doesn't have to deal with it. Uh, this makes makes the design work uh, often very challenging. Yeah, uh, I mean there there is a challenge which comes with, uh, of course, with with simplifying everything to its bare bones. And sometimes you have to get rid of some mechanics you really like. Uh, it might give you an interesting uh, decision from time to time to do something in a game like a hive mind. But 
then in the end, you have to say, well, I've just got to get rid of this uh, mechanic just because it's just not worth it. It's dragging the game down. And uh, you can get away with those little things a lot more in a game like Robo Rally than you can in a game like Hive Mind. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. I, I, I know that you've talked a lot about, um, especially in regards to magic, like a, a lot of the things that you've said about it now are that it is, and it's awesome for you to see it be such a complex game and, and people really come into it and enjoy it at, at a very high level. Um, but that also it's important to keep it uh, kind of geared towards, you know, being available to new players, that that's an important part of the process too, to, like you said, if you have a really intense game to try to make it more casual or to have a casual side to it that can uh, get those players involved. And I think that's an important, obviously, thing when you're coming into a gateway game that like that is the focus. So my question is, did you have that kind of experience uh, as kind of a fledgling uh, game player? Was there a gateway game that, that you looked at and started playing and said, I'm in this genre forever. This is, this is something I enjoy doing. The game which made me a game designer is Dungeons and Dragons. I, I haven't role played in a while. And, uh, and even back in the day, uh, I didn't stick with Dungeons and Dragons very long, but when I first played Dungeons and Dragons, I was blown away with, and, and this is when I was 13 or something, so it's yeah. <laughs> back in the late 70s. Um, but, but this game broke all my preconceptions about what games were like. Uh, it, it, it had no winner. Uh, it, it had, uh, um, the games could last indefinitely. Um, and, mm -hmm. and I thought, wow, if, if this game can exist and I had no idea what other games are out there that, that uh, are as orthogonal, the answer is none. But <laughs> there's a lot of very orthogonal games still. And, and, and the more I explored it, the more, uh, the more I thought that uh, games had this amazing breadth potential, uh, a lot of which had been achieved, but a lot was left there to achieve. Yeah, that's that's so interesting. I, I think certainly Dungeons and Dragons can be listed on most of our lists as like one of those early games, if not the early game that that got us involved. But ha have you not? Uh, you haven't designed a role playing game, have you? That I know of. <laughs> um, no, uh, I I've uh, I tinkered with uh, w uh, back in the day. I, I designed some for my own use. Um, none that I would publish. Uh, and when I was working at Wizards, I was tinkering with some designs. Uh, but, uh, but um, you know, someday maybe I will. But, uh, but uh, uh, I have ro role playing is a is a, uh, take takes a lot of effort, and yeah. uh, and uh, so uh, I, I have not uh, gone in that direction very much. I, I will. I would like to mention that the the other game, which uh, is a big influence, I think Dungeons and Dragons is the most important and is sort of the most original game ever made. But uh, another, the other big influence for me was uh, Cosmic Encounter, nice. and uh, that that <laughs> really got me thinking about this idea of uh, people having these. Uh, unique powers within a game, and uh, it and really that's one of the one of the biggest influences for Magic, where uh, we used to play Cosmic with uh, with several alien powers, and I began to think, well, if everybody's got all these different ways to break the rules, what if you know you had a deck and and all the cards broke the rules, and, and you know, wouldn't that be amazing? And uh, and and then when uh, there was at some point, I thought, well, what if everybody had their own deck, and then you know, magic was a, a few months away. And then it happened. That's awesome. Well, uh, Richard, you have been around the industry as we know it for, well, I mean, ever since we got involved in it, which is pretty cool to say, honestly. Um, so, what has you most excited? Uh, as far as what's going on in the industry right now. Tabletop gaming as an industry, there, some people call this the golden age of tabletop. Is there anything you're particularly excited about that's happening right now? Uh, certainly board games have never been as exciting to me. Uh, um, I love seeing the new stuff that's being done. And in particular, uh, I, I think it's a, it's board games are very exciting because the Euro game movement has really... Uh, mm -hmm gotten a lot more exciting as they've incorporated 
uh, more game mechanics and, 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 and things from other parts of the world. So there was a point where I really loved the Euro game movement, but there was just too much of the same, which is to say this sort of passive-aggressive parallel play. Uh, and, and now you're just seeing sort of much more variation uh, uh, in, in, in board games. Um, I'd say outside of board games, uh, the tablet gaming is, is very exciting to me. Cool. Uh, for since, uh, I would say in the 90s, uh, I was uh, playing computer games and, and I, I, I had this evening playing Scrabble online. <laughs> and then I played uh, some uh, uh, first person shooter probably. Yeah. And, and I thought that it was ridiculous that these two experiences, which I loved so much, were so completely different from one another and that you you would never have a game like Scrabble that evolved online at that time. And so I, 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 I really began to get uh, obsessed with this idea of what's in between Scrabble and and a first-person shooter. Uh, and and uh, it seemed like computer games was heading down this path of more and more simulation and, uh, and not taking all, all this... Uh, stuff I love from board games and tablet games I, I see is bridging that gap more I see many mm -hmm. more games uh, on the tablet which are sort of in this area where they feel like a board game and yet they're a computer game mm -hmm. does, does that kind of movement towards the electronic side of gaming just as a society as a culture does that scare you at all that the actual you know physical playing of the board game and that experience of being around with other people and sharing it with uh, you know other humans around a table that that is risky like like it could go away at some point i i don't i don't see it going away and and it's hard for me to tell how much of that belief is based on just noise in my experience but my experience has been that the electronic industry has grown and that has made more gamers and those gamers, you know, it's like people play board games more than ever now. And so it's, it's hard to tell if that's random. Personally, I don't think it is. I think that uh, people are becoming more gamers and that the human contact is, is, is an important part of that. I love face-to-face -face gaming, but uh, more so than uh, than than a lot of other gamers and designers, I really love uh, not being face to face too. Uh, the mm. the you know being able to play with other people any time of the day or night uh, uh, is is terrific. Yeah, and and that's something I would like to ask you is is there ideas that translate or come to you in other mediums outside of board gaming that you can even adapt to something like Hive Mind that aren't necessarily from the board gaming genre originally or otherwise? People have often asked me what my mathematical background has mm -hmm. had to do with my game design. And, and I've come around to thinking that, uh, that my math background is important to my game design, but it, it, it's important in, in the way that, for example, uh, random subjects are important to any writer. Right? There's no subject. Mm -hmm. If you were uh, a writer and you, uh, and you became interested in uh, whatever, the 1800s, uh, that would be good for your writing, if, uh, you know, even if you didn't write about the 1800s. And if you became interested in uh, uh, space travel or became interested in uh, biology, right, all those can impact your writing. And in the same way, any of these subjects can impact uh, game design. So uh, I find myself, uh, it, when I listen to a historical podcast, hearing some battle tactic and thinking mm -hmm. that I could design a game around that. When I sort of uh, uh, read something about evolution, I, sur uh, I start to think about how I can make a system which, uh, which parallels some of the mechanics that I'm reading about. Um, so, so I think it, really almost any subject uh, can have impact in, in game design. That's excellent. Yeah, I mean, get, so given that you, know, you do find these kinds of inspirations for mechanics everywhere uh, in life, that I have to wonder, whenever you're sitting down playing a board game uh, or any kind of game, really, are, can, you, can you have that like, giddy thrill of just playing a game that like, we're all kind of used to as kids, maybe when we first got into it? Uh, or are you constantly thinking on a mechanical basis of, you know, I have these many rupees and this mechanic is forcing me to want to place them here, but then I also have a long-term thing here. Uh, so how is your brain working whenever you're playing a game? Well, I've often... Uh 
felt like my game design is much worse when I'm not playing games. I think it's very important to sort of keep in touch with your inner gamer. And, uh, and so, uh, and, and when I start getting into this mechanical mode of thinking about it in terms of mechanics, uh, I become a, a much less happy gamer. Mm -hmm. uh, I become uh, sort of uh, very critical, and I try to uh, I try to keep away from that. Um, and so, so what I, I try to do is is play the games within the spirit in which they're intended, and sort of explore the boundaries of it. Uh, and, and and when when I uh, put on my game designer hat at that point, trying to uh, I try to be a little bit more critical. Yeah. Nice. And are there any game designers that you like that you uh, gravitate to more than others on a routine basis? Yes, many. Any anybody who's designed good games, uh, uh, I'm really interested in what they have to put out. So, uh, for example, I'm I'm always looking at what Antoine Bowser does. Uh, yeah, I really like the breadth of his work. He 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 really uh, captured me with uh, Seven Wonders, and one of my favorites is also uh, uh, Wolfgang Kramer. He's he's like of course been around forever and designed all these uh, uh, all these uh, really uh, big Euro games. But I'm constantly impressed by his breadth of design. If you told me that there was a Euro designer who had been designing for a long time, uh, I would sort of expect to be able to compartmentalize them a lot better than uh, Wolfgang Kramer. He he designs outside of that box quite a bit. Yeah, excellent. Well, that's, that's just excellent to hear kind of where you, you draw those inspirations and how you go about the process. And Hive Mind sounds like it's going to be a, a great gateway game and it's certainly going to kick off the Titan series with. Uh, and our, our core audience here is uh, a lot of LCG players and particularly a lot of Netrunner players. So, you know, it would be, I, I would not be allowed to get off an interview with Richard Garfield without asking, of course, about Netrunner, and this is one of your uh, earlier designs. It was post Magic. Uh, a lot of people said it was one of the best games, uh, certainly ever designed. And I'm just kind of curious: were you surprised to see Netrunner return in this LCG format, and and how has that made you feel? Uh, it's uh, it's wonderful to see it back. Um, yeah, no, I'm I'm very excited. I really like Netrunner a lot. I think there's a lot going on there. I think uh, uh, when it came out. I probably drank a little too much of that Kool-Aid, which said it was the best trading card game ever, uh, <laughs> because because it, and and it got frustrated by his performance, which was uh, not good, and and sort of saw, uh, and 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 I weighed in my head why that was the case because I really liked the game design, um, and at the time I think I decided that it was largely because of uh, Magic's success over shadowed Netrunner and that the company really couldn't support it properly. And there's probably some truth to that, but it wasn't many years uh, after that that I began to think, well, actually, you know, Netrunner, while being an excellent game, is not really the best trading card game. And this limited uh, 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 card format that uh, Fantasy Flight does uh, that may actually be the best format for it. So uh, it's it's like it was designed for that without realizing it ahead of time. And so it's really nice to see it uh, captured, recognized in that way, and and re uh, restructured for the, the the way it was intended to be, or it should have been designed from the first place. Yeah. Did, did you come into Netrunner with this asymmetrical style in mind, or is that something that arose out of kind of early playtesting? I've always wondered that, if, if you always intended it to be a corporation versus runner asymmetry, uh, or if that was kind of a later addition in the process. It was pretty early in the process, but, uh, but very early on I knew that I wanted it to be uh, runner versus corporation. So the only question there was whether one person was the runner and one or more other players were the hmm. the corporations uh, or whether there was a sort of fixed deck that everybody was playing against. And so mm -hmm. I did play around with some designs where the corporation was uh, uh, the sort of the uh, so something that was being run automatically and then you have several people who were the runner playing against the corporation. Um, but uh, But I really liked the idea of playing as the corporation you absolutely had to be have the runner as one of the roles but the 
uh, the the idea of having a player play as the corporation just felt so appealing. It felt like there's so much you could do with that. Uh, that that's what led me down this uh, asymmetric role. Nice. Uh, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> All right, Richard. Well, hey, thank you again so much for taking the time to talk to us, uh, especially about you know HiveMind, which is an exciting project and hopefully going to do uh, wonders just for the tabletop gaming industry as a whole and to get more people involved in this thing that we all love so much. And of course, for Netrunner. And, and the last thing that, that I do want to ask is uh, if, if there's somebody out there who's listening to this and they are not currently involved in tabletop hobby. They, they've heard about it, they kind of know bits and pieces, but haven't really you know, gotten hooked and gotten into a game or multiple games. What would you, what would you tell that person? Mm. See, that's, that's the orthogonal question that I was... Uh, <laughs> um, I, I mean, I, I, w I would say that uh, games are, uh, uh, I mean, games are an incredible hobby. And if you don't think you like games, which uh, it's amazing how many people I've asked who said mm -hmm. they don't play games, uh, then you just don't know uh, the game industry. And, and I recommend heartily that you, you, you start trying to find some games that you do like and play them. Part, part of the problem there is, a, is almost a cultural one with people who, this, this alien person who hasn't played games. Uh, um, I've asked a lot of people it's like one of the way, when when I meet somebody, I often ask them begin off with what what games do you play, uh, and if they say they don't play games, uh, I, I sometimes follow that up with like, oh really? Uh, is like a <laughs> poker? And oh yeah, I play poker. I love poker, right? And and it's almost like people don't uh, recognize what the game they play as being a game. It's something different. They play bridge, they play chess or whatever, but they don't play games. Right. And, and uh, and uh, I I have a lot of respect for people who play one game to exhaustion, where because games are often this amazing thing where they just get better and better the more you play with them. But at the same time, I think those people ought to sort of look around and, and try some other games. So great, I agree. Well, thank you so much again for everything here. And anyone out there listening, if you would like to catch Hive Mind, uh, one of Richard's newest games here, then check out the Titans of Gaming project. It is a fantastic project by Calliope Games, something we're all behind here at Team Covenant. So uh, thank you guys for watching. Richard, thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank and, you so much. Uh, we've got more coming, guys.